Tonight, we are continuing our 10-point program for living an orthodox life. And tonight, uh, we are on our third evening of it, honoring the liturgical cycle. So let's begin with that. Uh, the church, in her wisdom, offers us a cycle of fasting and feasting. This cycle is based on the life of Christ. The key for all of us is to learn how to follow this cycle, how to participate in it, and, and really not allow other activities in life to be viewed as more important. Uh, when we, uh, we, we are called to follow the prescribed fast times and participate in the major feast days of the church, we need to plan our schedule to make this a reality. We really shouldn't be surprised. For instance, Friday night, we have the feast of the uh, entrance of the Theotokos in the temple. This is one of the 12 great feasts of the church year. What I'm going to be sharing is a little bit of, of our calendar and the most important feasts. And what I'm hoping is that we all learn those feasts so we're not surprised when something comes up. Imagine if it was the 22nd of December and someone said, did you know that Christmas is in three days? Uh, I mean, that doesn't usually happen to us because we know the 25th of December or the 6th, if you're on old calendar, uh, 7th. Uh, and um, so we, we know when Christmas is, but we should know that for all the great feasts of the church year. It shouldn't really be any different. So in our church services and in our, in our use of liturgical time, we have various cycles in the church year. We have the, what we call the daily cycle. We have the weekly cycle and we have the yearly cycle. Tonight, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the yearly cycle. But before we do, I'd like us to look at the other two cycles briefly. So starting with the daily cycle. These are the things that occur every day in the life of the church. So we have our these different cycles. We have the daily cycle. And the daily cycle is made up of several services. And I'm just gonna run right through these services. The Vesper service, which we uh, associate with sunset, actually. The Compline service, the Midnight service, the Matin service, the first hour, third hour, sixth hour, and the ninth hour. These services are the main services of the daily cycle. In most parishes, we don't do all those services every day. In monasteries, they go through all these services every day. And sometimes they might group a couple together. Uh, they might group matins and first hour together. They might group a ninth hour at the end of the day and vespers together. So sometimes they combine services uh, rather than do them all at their kind of set periods of time. For us though, mostly what we do is vespers and matins in this cycle. Vespers in the evening, matins in the morning. And, uh, uh, as Bibi, who's here, knows in our church in Louisville, and this is before COVID, I'm not sure what's happening now with COVID, but before COVID, we would have Vespers and Matins almost every day. In most parishes, they will have Vespers on Saturday night, Matins on Sunday morning, followed by Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning. Divine Liturgy is not in the daily cycle. It's kind of a special service that comes in on certain days. 
So we don't have liturgy every day. And in monasteries, they usually don't have liturgy every day, but all of these services are called for every day. That's the daily cycle. And as I mentioned, we're most familiar with Vespers and Matins, but we do some of the other services. Actually, when we think of the Friday night Akathis service during Lent, that's actually the Compline service. Uh, when we have the royal hours on uh, Holy Friday, before Christmas and before Epiphany, if you ever come to the, uh, the royal hour services, that's actually the first, third, sixth, and ninth hour together. Don't often do the midnight service, um, but so that's, that's the daily cycle. So in addition to the daily cycle, we also have the weekly cycle. So let me look at that for a moment. The weekly cycle, this is a cycle that repeats every week. So each day of the week represents something and then it repeats every week. So Sundays represent the resurrection. Mondays are the holy angels. Tuesdays, John the Baptist. Wednesdays, the betrayal of Christ by uh, Judas and the cross. That's what we remember on Wednesday. Thursdays, the apostles and St. Nicholas. Friday, the passion of our Lord and the cross. And on Saturday, we remember the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, as well as the martyrs and all the saints. So we have this cycle and then back to Sunday again, and we remember the resurrection. So every Sunday is kind of like a little Pascha. Every Sunday is a resurrection day. That's why during the uh, little entrance, we have this rotation of hymns that we sing, and the theme is always the resurrection. At the end of the liturgy on Sundays, I say, Christ, our true God, he who is risen from the dead. I always say that on Sundays because Sunday is a resurrection day. If we were having liturgy on a Monday, I don't say who is risen from the dead. Actually, on Sundays, we commemorate everybody. We commemorate the resurrection. I say risen from the dead by the protection of the bodiless angelic powers through the supplications of the forerunner, John the Baptist, by the power of the precious and life-giving cross, uh, of the holy, glorious, and all-audible apostles. Uh, and so we kind of go through this whole list on Sunday. But if it was a Monday, we just really say, by the protection of the angels, and I don't say all the rest of them. If it's Tuesday, we say, at the... Uh, uh, supplications of John the Baptist. We don't say all the rest of them. So if you're at a service during the week, notice that. Notice that, that it's a little different in that way. So that's the daily cycle and the weekly cycle. Every week it starts over again. On Only on occasions will Sunday not be the resurrection. And that's if a great feast lands on a Sunday. If Christmas, for instance, landed on a Sunday, then the Christmas theme would replace the usual resurrection theme. So that's our weekly cycle. And let me move on now to the yearly cycle. And for our yearly cycle, this is really where we're going to spend pretty much the rest of our evening. Um, the yearly cycle has two parts. It has a fixed part and a movable part. By a fixed part, I mean that there are certain feasts, certain church holidays that are fixed. They are always on the same day every year. They don't change. And there's certain feasts, certain church holidays that change every year. They're not on the same day every year, so we call them movable. There's a book we used with to get all the information about the fixed feasts, and that's called the Menaean. Actually, the Menaean is not a book. It's really 12 books, 
there's a book for January, a book for February, a book for March, a book for every single month. So right now we're in the November Menaean book. And that's where we, would, where we would get certain of the hymnology that we would use at this time. Then there's the movable feasts. Um, and when we think of the movable feasts, we really think of Pascha, Easter, because you know how Easter is on a different day every year. And then there's all the things that are connected to Easter, like Palm Sunday. That's obviously a week before Easter. So if Easter is different every year, so is Palm Sunday is different every year. So is the beginning of Lent is going to be different every year because that's based on when Pascha is. And so the things that are connected to Pascha are on the, on the movable um, on the movable part of our yearly liturgical cycle. Uh, in the fixed in the fixed uh, cycle, we use the Menaean and there's 12 volumes of it. In the movable, there's actually three books that we mostly use. The Triodian book, the Pentecostarian book, and the Octoikos book. So in the old days, we, us we actually had these books out. And if you notice the, the Channer stand, it spins because they would have different, they'd have maybe several books out at the same time, and they would go back and forth. And now we print it out, really, so it's all mingled together in, um, in a 15 page document that we use for mat and so the chanters don't have to be going back and forth uh, from book to book. I learned it using all the books and in a way it's kind of a lost art because I don't think people nowadays it's like it's like the telephone book nobody would ever even look anything up in a telephone book anymore or even know what a telephone book is probably but we have these, um, these places where these hymns are found. Okay, let's look now at the yearly cycle. I have this diagram here that I'd like us to look at and spend a little time with. I'm going to blow that up a little bit. Okay, so we have this, um, this diagram here. So, if you look at the outside rings, so we have this kind of gold ring here going around and this other ring here at this point, it's, it's kind of pink. We have these two kind of outer rings. So this gold ring will represent the fixed cycle. And the one just inside, is uh, going to represent the movable cycle. So that's how I kind of put this diagram together. Some of you maybe have seen it before. Uh, the, the church year actually begins on uh, September 1st. So that's why we have September here on the very top. It's kind of like, this is a clock. It's kind of like midnight here. So the day be, the year begins on September 1st. On this outer ring, I have placed, uh, well, before I mention that, I should say in this yearly cycle, there are 365 days or 366 days, depending on the year, in this yearly cycle. This year, there's 366. Every single day of the year has some commemoration. Uh, and today, for instance, which is the 18th of November, the commemoration is the great martyr Plato of Ankara, the holy martyr Romanus, Zacchaeus the deacon, the holy new martyr Anastasius, and the martyr Romanos the deacon, as well as Anastasios the new martyr. So these are the people that we remember on November 18 every year. So if your name is maybe, 
I mean, we don't have too many people that go by these names, but if your name happened to be Zacchaeus or Romanos, this might be your name day today on November 18. So tomorrow there's a whole new set of names. So every day has commemorations. Now throughout the year, in addition to these general commemorations, occasionally there are some feasts or some saints that are more well-known and more generally celebrated. For instance, everybody that I just mentioned, they're not so commonly known. But when we get to November 8, for instance, that's the Feast of the Archangels. This is something that's more generally known. On December 6, for instance, is St. Nicholas. This is, St. Nicholas is someone that's more well-known and, uh, and more churches are celebrating the Feast of St. Nicholas. So we would call these feasts, uh, the Feast Day of St. Nicholas or the Feast Day of the Archangel, but they're not the great feasts. They're, they're important feasts, and many churches would have services for them. St. Philip is an important feast for our church. So some of the feasts have more importance for certain churches than other churches. Like St. Philip is big for us, and we're going to have a liturgy for St. Philip, but maybe other churches wouldn't have a liturgy for St. Philip. So we have the everyday commemorations, then these that I've just mentioned that are more well-known, and then we have what's called the Great Feasts. There are 12 great feasts throughout the year. There are nine of them on the fixed calendar and three of them on the movable calendar. So these nine on the fixed and three on the movable which if you look on uh, that diagram I have here, you'll see the little crosses I have. Those are all the great feasts. And if you count them, there's nine on the outer ring and three on the uh, more inner ring for the movable feasts. Let me just put a little parentheses in here for a moment. When I'm talking about dates, for instance, I said, St. Nicholas is December 6th, so the Archangels are November 8th. I am using what we usually call in the church the new calendar. Our church and our Antiochian Archdiocese uses uh, the, I don't want to call it the Gregorian calendar because it's not completely Gregorian, but we use the new calendar, which for the most part is very similar to uh, the, the day you see on your calendar. So if, if you know that today is the 18th of November, you look in the Menean for the 18th of November. We are basically saying the church calendar and the civil calendar are the same calendar. Now some, in fact, many Orthodox churches use a different calendar for the church calendar. They have their civil calendar where this is November 18, but on the church calendar, today is November 5th. The church calendar for these other churches, uh, mostly the Russian churches and churches influenced by them, the Ukrainian, the Serbian, uh, the Jerusalem church, um, many of the monasteries on Mount Athos, they use the, the um, what we usually call the old calendar. And the old calendar is 13 days behind the new calendar. So that's why I said it's November 18 on the new calendar, but the old calendar, it's only November 5th. That's why Christmas ends up being on January 7th for people on the old calendar because November 25th, when the civil calendar says November 25th, their church calendar, December 25th, 
their church calendar says December 12. It has, it's not December 25th yet. It's only December 12 on their church calendar, even though the civil calendar says the 25th. So January 7 ends up being December 25th on the church calendar for those who are using the old calendar method. It's 13 days behind. So actually, those who celebrate Christmas on January 7 still celebrate it on December 25th. In their liturgical books, it will say December 25th, not January 7, December 25th. In the Menaean, it says December 25th. The question is, when is December 25th? So they use one calendar for the church and one calendar for the civil. What we've done, uh, the Antiochians, the Greeks, the Romanians, for the most part, what we've done is taken the church calendar and matched it with the civil calendar to be less confusing. It's maybe less confusing for us, but then when a Russian comes to our church, they get confused again. So anyway... So if you look at that outside band, the yellow band, you'll see the pluses on the fixed calendar. And then that inner band, the pluses or crosses are on the Menaean. Now, let me go a little further into this. I'm going to zoom into the top right section here for us. So, so the church year begins in September, as I mentioned, and there are two great feasts in September. Uh, the first one being September 8th, which is the birth of the Theotokos, and September 14th, which is the Feast of the Cross. So these are the two uh, great feast days of the church year. There are 12 great feast days. We have liturgy pretty much for every single great feast day. We don't have liturgy for every minor feast or every saint on the calendar, but we have liturgy on every Sunday and every great feast. Now, we might have more liturgies than that for some of the important feasts like St. Nicholas or the Archangels, but we're definitely going to have them for the 12 great feasts and for every Sunday. So that's what I wanted to highlight now at this point for us. So, so we have um, those two great feasts starting in September. In November, we have no great feasts in October. We do have some kind of big feasts. St. James the Apostle is in October. Uh, the Holy Martyr... Uh, Demetrius is in October, so a lot of churches may celebrate liturgy for that. Um, in November, we begin a preparation period known as the Nativity Fast. This begins on November 15 every year. Sometimes we call it the Christmas Fast, and sometimes we call it Advent, and it's the 40-day period before Christmas. Christmas being December 25th, uh, the 40-day fast, the Christmas fast starts on November 15. And, and so we practice, uh, we practice that. In November also, uh, we have another great feast, the feast of the entrance of the Theotokos in the temple. And um, the Feast of the Entrance of the Theotokos in the Temple, and that's November 21st, and uh, which is this Saturday, actually. One of the practices that we do in the church in order to help more people come to the services is, and this is what we do at St. Philip's, uh, what we do is have our great feast day liturgies on the eve of the feast. So uh, if you remember that daily cycle at the beginning, the first service of the day was Vespers. 
so the the day actually begins with vespers the evening the evening is the beginning of the day and so we can do a service on the eve of the feast so a certain day begins in the evening and it lasts till the next evening so although today is november 18 in a way we've already entered november 19 because we're past sunset we would have already had vespers by this time and entered into the next day so we are having a liturgy for the feast of the entrance of the Theotokos in the temple on November, uh, on Friday, which is the eve of November 21st. I don't want to say it, it, I don't want to say it's the 20th because really the feast is the 21st and I don't want to confuse people. So I'll just say Friday night, we'll have feast for the entrance of the Theotokos. And so, uh, and this is in the middle of this, Christmas fast, and then um, we will have, uh, we will then be entering into December soon, and then we'll have the feast of uh, the feast of the Nativity. So, I mentioned the uh, the fast of the Nativity, and. Um, just checking if any people are, I think everybody is in right now that is trying to get in. Uh, I mentioned the nativity fast. Uh, so this is a 40 day fast where uh, to the best of people's ability, the church calls us to give up meat and dairy products for this period. In this country, our bishops have generally given us permission on Thanksgiving to to gather and have uh, meat on Thanksgiving Day to have turkey. It's more of an American issue in uh, Canada, for instance. Thanksgiving's in October, so they don't have to worry about the Nativity fast and Thanksgiving. In other countries, do it at different times, but we have that situation. For people that follow the old calendar and are in. Um, America, Thanksgiving usually falls before the Nativity Fast even begins. So for them, it's not really an issue. But for us, it's kind of an issue. And our bishop says, he kind of says, you don't have to worry about it on that day. Um, everybody is encouraged to take the fast seriously, to participate in the fast. Part of what I'm trying to do tonight is to help us see the importance of this cycle, of this calendar and how we participate in it. We participate in it by going to the services when there are great feasts, and when there are fasts, we participate in the fasts as well. In addition to these fasting seasons, like the Christmas fast, there's also fasting days. If you remember from the weekly cycle, Wednesday commemorated the betrayal and the cross of Christ, and um, Friday commemorates the passion and the cross of Christ. Those two days, Wednesday and Friday, are also fasting days, and we generally do not eat meat or dairy products on those two days. There are some exceptions, and one of those is after Christmas. After Christmas, this celebration of this great feast, one of the biggest of the great feasts, uh, there is no fasting at all for about 12 days. Uh, even on Wednesdays and Fridays, it's a fast-free period. And so I always find it enjoyable to have meat on a Wednesday or Friday during a fast-free period. Seems to taste better. I don't know. So let's move on here. I'm going to continue following the feasting period of Christmas, this 12 days, we come up to Theophany uh, in January, and Theophany, also known as Epiphany, uh, is uh, on January 6, and uh, this is commemorating the baptism of Jesus. 
after, uh, and then we come actually, as you go a little lower down that, that ring there, beginning of February, February 2nd, we have the Feast of the Entrance of Christ in the Temple, sometimes called the Meeting, uh, because Jesus meets the, the elder Simeon and the prophetess Anna, uh, and this is mentioned in Luke's Gospel. It actually happened 40 days after Jesus was born. This was the Jewish custom to bring the firstborn male child to the Temple to be presented and for the mother to be have a, a prayer of purification. And so we commemorate this by 40 days after Christmas. We celebrate the feast of the entrance of Christ in the temple. Now, shortly after, and it's different every year, shortly after the feast of the meeting on February 2nd, we begin thinking about our preparation for Pascha. And we enter a period of the church year known as the Triodian period. And that's what I have here in this um, kind of purpley, burgundy, sort of mauvish color. And it's different every year. Um, and I didn't even look it up on what day we're starting this period this year. But uh, sometime in February, usually, is when we, when we start that. Uh, we, we begin preparing actually with a three-week period before the Great Fast begins. And then we have the Great Fast, which is 40 days long. And then we have Holy Week, which is one week long. And then we have Pascha. So that's this whole, uh, this whole burgundy section over here is, um, is for that, is mentioning that. And um, during this period, this is probably the, this is the most strict fast that we have in the church. And people are, strongly encouraged to really put a lot of effort into keeping this as best they can. Uh, the sun, each of the Sundays has a theme that's designed to help us have a right attitude uh, for uh, the great fast. And, um, and so when the fast begins, we have guidelines that we are, that the church gives us to follow. And uh, we have extra services that are going on as well. We have Wednesday evening pre-sanctified liturgies. We have Friday evening Akathis service. And so this period of Great Lent becomes such a central and meaningful uh, time for us. And it's funny how certain events work themselves into one's life. Uh, when I think of my time, even for instance, my time at St. Philip's 20 years ago, I think those, that seasons, all the many seasons of great Lent probably stick with me the most. I don't know if it's because we spent more time together with all these different services or just the solemnity of the time period, or we're maybe a little bit more introspective or Maybe we've just slowed ourselves down a little bit and we see each other a little bit more clearly. I'm not really quite sure. Maybe it's the music that we sing. It's a little different during this time of the year, but it just sticks out in my mind. And when I think of past uh, events, most often my first feelings are connected to Great Lent, Holy Week, and Pascha. So, so we have our first feast of the movable, uh, our first feast of the movable calendar comes during um, this period. And it's a week before Pascha, and that's Palm Sunday. That is the first feast that I've mentioned so far that's on the movable calendar. It's movable because it's always different every year. It depends when Pascha is going to be. 
And if you look kind of down below um, in the gold, there's one other feast. It's the only fixed feast that falls during the Triodian period. And that's the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25. The Annunciation is commemorating when the angel Gabriel went to Mary to tell her she was going to give birth to Jesus. And that was nine months before she gave birth on Christmas. So that's why it's on March 25th, which is at exactly nine months before December 25th. And so it's very much, it's really connected to Christmas, even though it always falls in Lent, it's not particularly a Lenten service. So it's, that's the only major fixed great feast day that falls during Lent. And then, uh, and then we have Palm Sunday, which is a movable feast. Then we have Pascha. Actually, then we have Holy Week. Um, and I won't go into all of Holy Week, but then we have Holy Week, the week celebrating all the events of the Passion. Then we have Pascha, the resurrection. Now, I talked about the 12 great feasts. Pascha is not one of the 12 great feasts. When we count the number 12, we don't list Pascha. Pascha is above the 12 great feasts. Pascha is the feast of feasts. Everything depends on Pascha, so it's not just listed as one of the 12. So we have the 12, we have Pascha really on top, and then we have the 12. You can think of it as the Lord, and then his 12 apostles. And then you have other major feasts, and then you have all the days of the year. So, but Pascha is the feast, the feast of feasts. So following Pascha, um, there's another period of fast-free, it's a fast-free season. And so uh, in the Antiochian Archdiocese, they usually have a 40-day fast-free season. That means basically no fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays up till Ascension. And then Ascension is the next, uh, the next feast that we see, and here's Ascension up here. Ascension isn't on a particular day. It's 40 days after Pascha. It always lands on a Thursday, but the day of the year could be different depending on when Pascha is. We usually have liturgy on a Wednesday night uh, for Ascension. Let's zoom into this section now. So here again is Ascension right here. This right here is Ascension. 10 days after Ascension is the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is a great feast. Palm Sunday is a great feast. They're on the movable yearly cycle. The date is different every year, but both Palm Sunday and Pentecost always land on a Sunday. That's just the nature of how it's counted. They always land on a Sunday. And so actually those are two days when the theme of resurrection is not there. On Pentecost Sunday, it's the theme of the Holy Spirit. And on Palm Sunday, the theme is the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. And we put the resurrection uh, theme aside for those great feast days that land on a Sunday. And so uh, we have the Feast of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit. And although there's no great feast in, um, in July, and there's no fixed great feast really in June or July, we do have certain feasts that are kind of popular. Uh, we have the Feast of the Apostles, at the end of June, we have the Feast of Peter and Paul at the end of June. But these are not part of the 12 great feasts. They're more like the Archangel or St. Nicholas. They're big feasts, but they're not part of the 12. Uh, and in July, we have the prophet Elias. Uh, there is also a fasting period 
called the Apostles' Fast that starts on the second Monday after Pentecost and goes up till the Feast of Peter and Paul, which is June 29. So we call that the Apostles' Fast. This is the only fasting season that has a different duration every year because the beginning of it, which is the second Monday after Pentecost, that's a different day every year. But the ending of it is June 29. So the ending stays the same, but the beginning changes. So one year it might be shorter, and another year it might be longer. If Pascha is earlier, then Pentecost is earlier, the Apostles' Fast will be longer. If Pascha is later, then the Apostles' Fast will be smaller, shorter duration. It's even possible that the second Monday after uh, Pentecost starts after June 29. If that happens, then we don't even have an Apostles' Fast that year. And that happened a few years ago. It was very strange. And the, the, uh, the second Monday was like on was like on June 30th or something. And so we didn't even have an Apostles' Fast that year. So then our next great fast occurs, a feast occurs as we get to the end of the church year. We have on August 6th, the Feast of the Transfiguration. And then on August 15th, the Feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos which uh, the Transfiguration commemorates Jesus going uh, on the mountain in the presence of Peter, James, and John. They go up with him, and they see Moses and Elijah appear on the mountain, and Jesus becomes very, very bright. Uh, and his, his true essence is seen by the apostles, and they fall down. They can't even look upon him. Uh, that's the Transfiguration. Uh, we have a blessing of grapes usually on the Feast of the Transfiguration. The Dormition, August 15, is the commemoration of the, of the uh, repose of the Virgin Mary. And so, and her uh, ascension into heaven. And that's actually preceded by a two-week fast from August 1st to the 14th. And then we have the feast itself of the Dormition. So that is the church calendar. Let me just sum up a little bit here. We have great feasts. We have 12 of them. Some of them are on the movable cycle. Some of them are on the fixed cycle. The movable cycle all has to do, something has to do with Pascha. They're all based on when Pascha is. So of the movable, the three are Palm Sunday, which is always one week before Pascha, the Ascension, which is always 40 days after Pascha, and Pentecost, which is 10 days after Ascension or 50 days after Pascha. Those are the three movable feasts of the great feasts. Then of the fixed cycle, we have nine. So the three and the nine make up the 12. In sept on September 8, the birthday or nativity of the Theotokos. September 14, the elevation of the cross. On the 21st, which is coming up, we'll have Liturgy Friday, entrance of the Theotokos into the temple. On December 25th, the nativity of our Lord, Christmas. On January 6th, Theophany, or the baptism of Jesus, or also known as Epiphany. Theophany means the manifestation of God. Epiphany means manifestation. Um, and both of them really commemorate the baptism of Christ and uh, the Father's voice saying, uh, Behold my Son, and, um, and the Spirit appearing in the form of a dove so the trinity or is is manifested that's why it's called theophany manifestation of god 
on February 2, the meeting of the Lord in the temple. On March 25th, the Annunciation, nine months before Christmas. On August 6th, the Feast of the Transfiguration. And on August 15, the Dormition of the Theotokos. These are the 12 great feasts of the church year. Uh, we should go to all of these 12 great feasts. We don't really call them in the Orthodox Church days of obligation. We just call them great feast days. And there's an expectation, though, that we should. Um, if we're active Orthodox Christians, we should go to church on Sundays and on all these great feast days. And I just wanted to, in addition to the great feasts, we have the four fasting seasons I wanted to mention. We have the Dormition Fast uh, from August 1st through 14th. We have the Nativity Fast from November 15th to the 24th. We have the Great Fast, which is uh, the combination of Great Lent and Holy Week. And so that's a different, uh, it's not a fixed day that it starts on every year, but it's a 40-day Great Lent, seven-day um, seven Holy Week, a 47-day altogether fasting season. And then we also have the Apostles' Fast, which is in the summer, ending on June 29, which can be later, longer or shorter, depending on if Pascha is earlier or later. And in addition to those, I just want to mention again the weekly fasts. On the weekly cycle, we have on Wednesdays and Fridays, generally, these are fast days, and uh, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, for instance, uh, the period after Christmas, the uh, period after Pascha, um, and a few other days throughout the year, we have fast-free seasons. So uh, Wednesdays and Fridays and certain exceptions. Really, if you add up all the fast days of the church year, I forget what the number is, but over 50% of our liturgical calendar is a fasting, is fasting. If we actually follow the fasting calendar and uh, didn't eat meat during these times and tried to stay away from dairy as well during these times, it's actually a very healthy way of living. You know, people say we're having too much meat. Imagine the church already puts it in the calendar less than half of the year we should be having meat. And so um, it's a good way to, in addition to it, just helping give our minds and our souls this rhythm, this liturgical and prayerful rhythm. It's also just very healthy for us as well. So uh, how do we celebrate this liturgical cycle? We should know when the great fasts, the great feasts and the fasts are. We should know that the entrance to the Theot of the Theotokos of the temple is November 21st. We should know that Theophany is January 6th. These are things we should, if we don't know them, we should learn them. We should prepare for them. Uh, Christmas, we kind of do prepare for Christmas. We think about that, but we can prepare for the other ones. We have uh, house blessings associated with Theophany. We have blessing of grapes associated for uh, with transfiguration. We, uh, people can bring basil into the church for feasts of the cross. There's different things that different feasts are connected with. There's the uh, cooking of the zelebi on uh, Epiphany, Theophany as well. And so there's these, these customs and traditions that help us prepare for these feasts. And we should participate in the fasts. We should participate in the seasonal fasts and in the weekly fasts. We should know what they represent, why we're fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays. And, and, and if it's uh, the f beginning of August, it's because we're preparing for the great feast of the Dormition. Uh, we should attend liturgy for the feasts. 
we usually have them on the eve of the feast to make it easier for people to get to church rather than having it on the morning of the feast at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock and less people are able to get to church during those times. Or I guess I could have it at six o'clock in the morning and people could be able to go before work, but I know we're less apt to get people. So we've been doing it on the eve and it works pretty well. We should arrange our schedule. We shouldn't be surprised at this. You know, we should be aware of it. Think about it ahead of time. You should, you should put it on your calendar. These things are coming up and um, arrange your schedule so that it is a priority and not just a, a secondary thing that we have um, uh, for these feasts. So these are ways that we can celebrate the liturgical cycle. And so I wanted to kind of leave us off with a, um, um, some words of my seminary professor, Father Alkiviadis Kalivas. And um, this is uh, something he wrote regarding these, uh, the liturgical cycle, this, this calendar made up of uh, movable feasts and fixed feasts and the fasts. So I'm just going to read this section here. The Orthodox Christians inhabit and measure time by a calendar itself touched by the incarnate word of God, the recurring rhythms of the year, the months, the weeks, and the days, alternating with nights, mean much more than the simple passage of time. They also constitute the decisive and supreme moments when the word of God was incarnate and lived among us. He was born, died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. These acts upon which our salvation is grounded occurred once and for all, but in the very rhythm and flow of time, they are remembered, celebrated, and experienced anew. So let me just stop for a moment. When we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration, it is as if we were on the mountain with Peter, James, and John too. When we're at Epiphany, Theophany, the, bap the blessing of the waters, it's like John the Baptist is present with us and we are there at that time. We're entering into that mystical moment. So it's experienced anew. In every liturgical event, we encounter Christ, who once was dead and now lives, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. In every liturgical event, he renders actual both his past saving work and its fulfillment. Amid the flux of time, worship introduces us to the end of time. He who is enthroned on high with the Father is also invisibly with us from the prayer of the divine liturgy. He who is to come again to judge the living and the dead has never left us. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age from Matthew chapter 28. The church through her kerygma, kerygma is uh, the good news or the proclamation through her preaching, uh, the gospel and the sacraments call the lords of creation, that's us, we are the lords of creation, to a union with the creator. The new world is working itself out, but in the mystery of faith, hidden from the wise of this world. Worship in general and the sacraments in particular introduce us to the future age and kingdom. The risen Christ is made manifest. We participate in the saving acts of his life so that our life may be continually, continuously renewed and refashioned in the likeness of him who made us.